Yeah. And remember, this is called beat the speaker. Yeah. So you're supposed to ask tough questions. <laughs> Uh, and that's the standard. The standard is not agreement with me. The standard is disagreement with me. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, thanks. I came just to ask you a question. Because, uh, I did all this objective stuff in college, and I love it. And I, I agree with every word you said. It's nice to see you first of all. Thank you. Uh, with that said, I've been here with the Hong Kong. Uh, I'm in the law department. And at a university? At the university. Okay. And we're under a lot of scrutiny at the moment because of the events that you alluded to that said a year ago, two years ago, here in the city. And so my question for you is because I've never been able to square away. I've never been able to square objectivism with the actual situation on the ground here. Um, Ayn Rand on the one way, in, on the one hand, entirely pro-capitalism. On the other hand, I don't know if I would call her pro-democratic because she was, certainly wasn't for mob rule but she was completely anti-communist. So what would, you know, year after year after year, Heritage and, and other organizations say, yeah, number one in the world, Hong Kong's number one in the world with economic freedom. Sure. But it's, a, it's an economic freedom, the superstructure upon which is built a political system where you have an oligarchy that has sold out its interests to a communist party, which is holding a gun at the city. And the situation's going to probably get worse before it gets better. So, You're an what, optimist. <laughs> what do you think, uh, I, I mean, how do you square this? How do you square uh, these two things which uh, seem, seem to be not in harmony? So you can't because they're not in harmony and that's why you're getting conflict. Um, so, so, so let's think back about the history, a, a little bit about the history of our economy. Some of you might know this better than I do. But my understanding of the history of Hong Kong is that Hong Kong was set up by the British as a place that respected the rule of law. The rule of law was there primarily to protect property rights. And you were left free, basically, you, you were left free otherwise. You didn't vote, but you had freedom of speech, and you had freedom of contract, and you had property rights, and you were left alone. But there was never, as, as, as Robert alluded to, there was never a convention, a constitutional convention to choose these things. Um, there's no constitution that defines them. It was basically imposed by the British, and tradition has kept it going. And in more recent times, as you said, a deal has been cut with the Communist Party. And I think as a consequence of that deal, freedoms are declining in, in, in Hong Kong, uh, both economic freedoms and, I think, uh, uh, free speech and um, uh, rule of law. Chinese government is starting to have an impact on the, on the legal system and so on. Now, why? Or, or how, do, how do we... How do, and, and, and the demonstrations now are not so much about let's resurrect contract freedoms of contract, let's resurrect free speech. They're more about we want to vote. We, we, want, to, we want democracy. So what you've got here is, in my view, bad ideas on all fronts. So you're choosing between false alternatives. The alternative should be what we want is a constitutional republic. Oh, it wouldn't be a republic, but a constitutional government in Hong Kong. What we want is, yeah, we want to elect our representatives, but we also want those representatives to have almost no power, which is Ayn Rand's view of government, right? Government is there basically to protect us, protect our rights. So uh, protect our freedoms, protect our freedom of action. That's it. So police, or military, judiciary, but that's it because... We should all be free to choose our own values and pursue our own lives. And that's that party, that side, again, I, I don't know the details, is not a big is not represented in any big way in Hong Kong. Because most people think that democracy is the ideal. But democracy is in many ways a false god. It's a false ideal. Qua democracy, qua majority rule. Because it says that the individual now is not sovereign. The individual is not owns himself. He's a pawn of the majority. The role of government is to protect the minority. And the smallest minority in the world is whom? We. Individuals. So the whole role of government is to protect individuals. Individuals' rights to live their life as they see fit. Individuals' freedom. So what you need in Hong Kong, just like you need, just, and this is true of all countries in the world, unfortunately, 
The, the, the current system is not right, even though you're number one in the rankings. Uh, the whole world is moving away from freedom. You're just moving maybe a little slower than everybody else. Maybe. I don't even know. Right? There, again, there are experts here. You know more about Hong Kong than I do. The alternative is not between, um, uh, you know, returning to, you know, to, to the way it was before, because the way it was before was imposed. It wasn't chosen. And it was not understood. And, and, and I, think, I think a source of that lack of understanding or, or evidence of that lack of understanding is the fact that the rebellion is happening from the wrong direction. Um, but the alternative can't be democracy. Now, let's talk a little bit about democracy, because me saying democracy is a false god is a pretty controversial statement, almost as controversial in the world we live in as saying the self-interest is good. Right? What's the problem with democracy? The problem with democracy is that it places the group, the majority, above the individual. So let's talk about a few examples. The, the example I always use is the example of, of Athenian democracy. In Athens, 2,000-something years ago, Socrates, the great philosopher, but you know who Socrates is? Socrates, the great philosopher, is going around town and he's engaging with individuals in discussion. Right? He's challenging their beliefs questioning what they hold. If you read Plato's dialogues, you know this, right? He's asking them tough questions. He's challenging them. In other words, he's corrupting young people. That's how we would view it today. And that's how the Athenians viewed it. So the Athenians said, he's corrupting young people. He's corrupting youth, and that's bad for society. It's not good for the common good. So they got together, and they said, what are we going to do about Socrates? Well, they voted. What did they do about Socrates? Yeah, they killed him because it's the only way to silence Socrates. If you want to stop, if you want to have him stop corrupting the youth, you kill him. Now, they gave Socrates a chalice of poison, and uh, Plato says, "I've got a tunnel; we can escape." And Socrates said, "No, I believe in democracy." And he drank the poison, but he died because of his speech, because of his ideas, not because of he murdered somebody, but because he spoke. That's democracy. Democracy. There's no free speech in democracy if the majority decides. To silence you, then the majority gets its way. Now, modern democracies in the West today have a certain level of respect for free speech. They've decided that for now, we're going to leave people alone and they can speak and we won't use democratic powers against them. Unless, for example, you're in Sweden and you say things that offend people and you get to go to jail for six months. There's no free speech in Sweden. There's no free speech in most of Europe. They have hate speech laws. So if you offend people... You don't get to speak. So, other examples of democracy. My neighbors get together. And my neighbors decide, as a group, that they would rather have my house be a tennis court that they can all use than me living in that house. And they vote on it. And all the neighbors think it's a good idea. So, democracy would say, cool, you're on, you're out of the house, we're going to turn it into a tennis court. Now you laugh, but this this is this is reality. This is happening in America today. Not for tennis, granted, <laughs> but a Walmart or a big department store, right, wants to move into a neighborhood, and the neighborhood's in the way. There are houses there where they would like to pave over and create them all. They go to the city council and they vote. Oh, we don't need this neighborhood. All you people, we're going to pay you a little bit of money to get out of your homes. And, we'll, and it's, it, there's a, there was a Supreme Court decision called Kilo, which basically said, yeah, that's okay. A majority can decide to take your home away from you if it's deemed in the public good. Eminent domain, eminent domain is, one for, is, is the form in which it's used, but I'm talking about it's democracy. Eminent domain is just a fancy word for democracy. That kind of democracy is not good. It's authoritarianism by different guys. People should elect their representatives, absolutely. But their representatives should be very, very limited. This is what the Bill of Rights does, right? In the American Constitution, the Bill of Rights says, you can vote on everything except free speech. Free speech is absolute. Except, you know, a freedom of religion. Freedom of religion is absolute. You can vote on these things, except people have a right to own guns. Now, what exactly that means and everything we can debate, but it's in the Constitution. So you can vote, but it doesn't count. That's what the Supreme Court is there. That's what Hong Kong needs. It needs a constitution with a clear bill of rights that says this is what freedom means. 
this is what you're protected from. And yes, go ahead and choose your representatives, but they can't take your house away. They can't limit your speech. They can't do all these other things. And now, how are you going to ever get there? Because the Constitution is fading in America, never mind here in Hong Kong. You're not going to get there unless we, the people, believe in it. And, and that's, that's the sad reality. Or at least the intellectual elite believe in it and convince we, the people. So what we have today is people who hold, I think, false ideas and who are struggling and fighting over this. And, and the fact that Hong Kong is the freest country in the world... Uh, is not going to prevent it from becoming less free and is not going to in and of itself create a constitution. That has to come from the intellectuals convincing the people that this is the right thing to do and, and, and you get that. And unfortunately, I'm not that optimistic about our ability to do that in the short run. It takes a lot of work. And sometimes it might take a disaster for people to wake up and realize what's actually happened. I don't know. But, but that's the kind of work that needs to be done. Not to convince them of democracy, not just to go after the communists, but to actually present an alternative, an alternative that is better. And I think the alternative for Hong Kong, just like for any country in the world, we're all the same in this sense. We all need limited government, a government limited by a constitution. Yeah. Uh, my question is... I think they want to use a mic. Okay. And then we're going to go to the... Go behind you. Uh... I uh, really like what you talked about last night about welfare. I, I think these uh, kids should hear that. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, most, I would say most or many people think that one of the core roles of the government is to provide welfare. So I was hoping uh, to know how, how do you feel about that? So I think welfare um, is a in, inherently immoral program for two reasons. And I'll state the obvious one first, and then I'll get to the less obvious. Because it takes stuff from people who don't want to give it. By force. By coercion. I'm against coercion. I'm against force. You want to help other people? Go ahead. Do it with your own money. Don't force me to help the people you want to help. And again, democracy, right? You get enough people to vote to force me to help other people. That's wrong. That's force. That's coercion. I like to, I like to give this example. Um, my neighbor... My neighbor gets sick, and he needs some rare treatment that costs a lot of money. And he has, he basically, and let's say I have money. He has two options. He has two options, and only two options. He can come to me, and he can ask me to help. And I might help him, and I might not. It depends. Depends on what other uses I have for the money. It depends whether he's a nice guy or not, whether I like him or not. The other alternative, the only other alternative, is for him to pull out a gun and to force me to give him the money. Everybody in the world recognizes that's stealing. That's wrong. We don't allow that. We put people in jail for that. Oh, but you say, there is a third alternative. He goes to the neighbors and he gets them all to vote to take my money. And we call it taxes. And now, not only isn't he a thief, he's a hero. But he still took my money by force without my consent. That's exactly what he did. It was my money, not his, not yours, not the neighbor's, not the neighborhood's, mine. And it was taken from me by force. And if you don't believe taxes are force, try not paying them. <laughs> and you land up with a policeman at your door being dragged to jail. That's force. That's coercion. So that's reason number one. I'm against coercion and therefore I'm against any form of redistribution of wealth. But there's another reason, which I think in some ways is more tragic, sadder. When you give people welfare, when you hand people a check unconditionally for a long period of time, you institutionalize them, institutionalizing them into unhappiness, institutionalizing them into poverty, institutionalizing them into lack of self-esteem. I mean, you guys can laugh, and I know it sounds ridiculous because nobody says this stuff, but the fact is that you gain self-esteem from working. You gain pride from knowing you can take care of yourself. And when you are not dependent on other people to achieve everything that you achieve in life, you never gain the self-esteem. And without self-esteem, you cannot be happy. And by giving people checks unconditionally, 
You're telling them you're worthless. You can't even get a job. Here, I need to help you. You're so pathetic. That is a horrible message you're sending kids. You're sending families. You're sending people who could work for a living. A good friend of mine tells the story. John Allison tells the story of his grandfather. His grandfather was a bricklayer. Made very little money. But he went to work every day and he worked hard and he made enough money to feed his kids and to put a roof over their head. And at the end of every day, he felt proud that he had put bread on the table. And he was a happy man. And at the end of the day, his grandson became the CEO of one of the most successful companies in American history. And that made him proud because to some extent, he made that possible. If you take that same man and you give him more money, but now the money is not as a consequence of an action that he did, not a consequence of the work that he did, but just because he's alive, just because he needs it, you have destroyed that man. You've destroyed his pride. You've destroyed his self-esteem. And it's no accident that social mobility decreases when you include welfare. It doesn't increase. Poor people don't rise out of poverty more when you give them welfare. They rise out of poverty less because you're giving them fewer opportunities. Indeed, you're destroying opportunities for them. So to me, the tragedy of welfare, the tragedy of things like the minimum wage, are the kids and the families that are receiving it, the kids and the families that are priced out of the labor market, that will never have a job, will never have a sense of pride, will never have the self-esteem, will never be happy human beings. What a waste of a life, which is sad. It's sad. I care about poor people. I do. About poor people who want to who make a, a better life for themselves. And therefore, I want them left free so that they can do it, so they can have the opportunities. Um, I have uh, an incredible amount of questions. I know. So. <laughs> I can tell by your face if you have an incredible <laughs> yeah. amount of questions. <laughs> um, I don't know where... I don't, there you go. I don't know where to start, but I'll start with uh, something that really puzzled me that you said about Bill Gates. Yeah. Uh, which was that um, creative people, people that make money, uh, are not glorified in our society, are rather put down for their efforts. And I was wondering what you think of the counterpart of Bill Gates, Mr. Steve Jobs, who... Um, is glorified as an innovator, as a creative man who has created lots of wonderful products, has gained a lot of money through doing so, and now has two movies that are Hollywood <laughs> movies. Don't exactly movies. glorify you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs is, seems like he's kind of an exception to, to what I just mentioned. Um, Steve Jobs was cool. You know, he wore the right shirts, he had that yes. charisma, he had that ambiance. He was cool. And he, and he created products that every one of us immediately got, right? We got it. We got the value to us. So we admired him to a large extent. But you know what? I, and I noticed this because I, I, I loved Steve Jobs, right? I never, never met him. But one of the... S- <laughs> of all- That's a local joke. Yeah, there's a local joke. Okay. <laughs> Somebody at some point will explain it to me, I'm sure. <laughs> but when he died... I was really sad. I mean, sadder than almost anybody else who's died that I know, because he impacted my life in really profound ways. So I noticed this. About two weeks after he died, the article started to show up. Steve Jobs was only interested about Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs never did any philanthropy. Apple didn't have a foundation. Steve Jobs was an egomaniac who yelled at his employees, and, and, and it was a perfectionist. How dare he be a perfectionist? You didn't get it maybe here in Hong Kong. We got we got this, right? Now, again, he was cool. So, so, so people kind of, and even the movies, the movies, people at Apple are saying that the movies are primarily focused on the negative sides. And there's, a, there's another point here. Look, generally, the culture admires entrepreneurs. It admires Steve Jobs and even Bill Gates, up to a point. And always in non-moral, non-ethical terms. Yeah. I want to be that. Right? I want to be an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. Do I think it's moral and good? Eh, that's a different category. Right? That's another two reasons. I'm saying, why are we separating the character? The, the, nobody thinks of Steve Jobs. You're not going to have Steve Jobs statues and Steve Jobs boulevards, and we're not going to teach in business ethics classes how wonderful Steve Jobs is. Part of, part of the whole campaign around Foxconn and, and workers is part of undercutting Steve Jobs' legacy because we don't want him up there on the pedestal. Mother Teresa's on the pedestal. 
And you cannot have on the same pedestal Steve Jobs and Mother Teresa. Because Steve Jobs was motivated by himself, by his own uh, uh, passion, by his own interest, by his own perfectionism. Mother Teresa was motivated by helping other people. That was a sole motivation. Pleasing God. If you read her diary, that's all she wants to do is to please somebody else. It's not about who. Those people don't belong in the same pedestal. And we don't in society. I would take Mother Teresa off the pedestal and leave Steve Jobs there. Steve Jobs is the hero. Steve Jobs lived a life that I can admire and respect. Steve Jobs made the most of the one life that he had here. Mother Teresa, read uh, Christopher Hitchens' book on Mother Teresa. <laughs> Strongly recommend. You want a, a second question? Um, sure. Um, yeah, you okay. get $100 for each participant. Okay. <laughs> you can't get all three best questions. You don't get one. Sorry. No, no, but she, she doesn't agree with me, so I'm going to give her another question, but I will get to you, I promise. I, um, okay, which one of them? Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, I'll ask you about um, the freedom of choice being uh, a justification for an ethic, a morally correct society. Um, I'm, I'm generally confused in this conception that um, choosing between maybe five bad options um, and the ability to do so um, is something that is uh, ethically good. So, for example, your, your example was the, it was the Chinese, um, I don't know what exactly what... Well, Fox Foxconn and he could... He could go back to the farm or he could get a, a, be, a worse job and he chooses Foxconn because it's the best available, but he's still only making three bucks a day or whatever. Exactly. Okay. That example. Um, yeah. uh, and so I was wondering uh, why it should be, uh, how, how it could be ethically justifiable in any way um, that there are only five bad options. How, how, how can it be ethically justifiable to have a system in which people have only five options, which are all horrible? Um, why well, is that a good system? Well, first of all, why are they horrible? They're horrible by your standards, not necessarily by their standards, first. But second, we have to understand the starting point. Right? Again, we in the West, sitting on our sofas, watching 150 channels of television, and living the good life that middle classhood provides us in Hong Kong and in America, our options, we see the world, you know, we're rich, and we think everybody's always been rich. We do. We, 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 we inherently think that. We, we see other people over there that are poor, but we think, why aren't they rich? They should be rich just like us. But how do you get rich? The fundamental question is, how do you get to where we are today? How do you get there? What is the, what is the starting point for all human beings? Well, where were we 250 years ago? What options did we have before we had this system, this capitalist system? Where, 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 how many people were poor as a percentage of the population? I mean, not poor as a foxcom, poor subsistence farming level. Poor in a sense of you grow the stuff that you eat and you work from sunrise to sunset. You sleep and you start over. Poor so that all your kids are working all day. How, what percentage of the population 250, 300 years ago was poor like that? 90 to 95%. The standard of human life is poverty. That's the starting point. Wealth has to be created. Wealth has to be made by somebody. By somebody making the choice to leave that farm, take a huge risk, and go and do something else. And a peasant in China, in central China, has to make a choice, a brave choice in my view, to leave the subsistence farming and to go and choose to work in a factory. And learn a skill in that factory. And that's not a bad choice. That's a great choice. To learn a skill in that factory in advance and become better. And the only reason he has that choice, the only reason that choice is available is because of Steve Jobs. Is because of Bill Gates. Is because of Wall Street. Evil bankers. Oh, my God. But without capital, none of those choices exist. And capital doesn't exist unless somebody creates it. And we're back to the Steve Jobses. And we're back to Wall Street. They are the engine that makes it possible for people to rise out of poverty. You want to focus on the five choices that he has. I am saying five choices. We've come a long way in human history to get to five choices. We used to have only one, which was death. And the only way to get to five choices and to take five choices and make them 500 choices. I face 
Hundreds of choices. How do I get there? With freedom. With allowing entrepreneurs to create stuff, to build stuff, allowing bankers to fund stuff, allowing for capitalism to work. Because without it, we're back to the one choice, which is I'm a farmer. I mean, so there is no other option. Those are the only two options that exist. It's no accident. If you look, no whiteboard. I'll do it in the air. Are there, are there things? Anyway, it doesn't matter. I can do it in the air. It's pretty simple, right? Here's a graph, right? See the graph? Yeah. This is time. This is wealth or income per capita. Wealth or income per capita. 10,000 years ago, we're starting at 10,000. What do you think the graph looks like? Like this. Like this. No way, right? Greece goes up, then it crashes, then Rome goes up, and then it crashes. But basically, we're static, and then it goes like that. I mean, I have to go on tiptoes to reach the top, right? And what happens there? What happens at the inflection point? What's the inflection point? What's that? No. Freedom. What happens in the inflection point is freedom. What happens in the inflection point is the Industrial Revolution. What happens in the inflection point is the creation of the United States of America that, that, that allows people to be free. Look at history. The inflection point is that point in which in Europe and in, and, and in the United States, people are suddenly free to be entrepreneurs. And boom, we create. And then in Asia, it stays flat. And there's another inflection point. And what's that inflection point? It's when Taiwan and South Korea and other countries, the Asian tigers, discover capitalism. And they embrace it. And suddenly they become rich. And then this, it stays flat a little bit longer for China. And then it goes like this because it discovers just a little bit of freedom. And boom, people become rich. Freedom is the only way in which we increase the choices from one to five to 500. Wouldn't you say those choices are created through technological advances, rather, that permit different lifestyles, rather than it being through... A Where does technology... You know, it, it amazes me. Where does technology come from? It just springs out of the human mind and it's just there? Where does technological advances come from? Why did technological advances start in around 1760, 1770, and didn't happen before that, and didn't happen 2,000 years before that? Why did they happen then? Why have they accelerated through time? And why are most technological advances in the world happening in the, in, in the United States and not in communist China or communist USSR? What's that? Because you don't need to grow your own food, but, they, but why don't you need to grow your own food? Because you have the only place, the only context for technological advancement is economic freedom. It's just, just take a chart of the countries that have technological progress where entrepreneurs have created stuff and rank them based on freedom. And the correlation is almost perfect. Soviet Union didn't innovate. The United States did. The UK during the 19th century had massive innovation. Other countries didn't, where there was no freedom, didn't. Africa to this day doesn't innovate very much. Why? Because they're not free. There's nothing inherent about Africa that, that should prevent them from having innovation. They don't innovate because they're not free. Do the, do the study. I mean, I, I, this is data. Just look at the empirics. This is reality. And, but we've been taught that technological innovation comes out of nowhere, that it just springs out of the human mind, uh, that entrepreneurs are there as a metaphysical thing, that they don't require any particular needs. And we're taught that there's no difference between freedom and unfree countries. But there is a huge difference. But how can you say that there was no technological advances in the Soviet Union when there were a lot of, I mean, whatever. One, I'll, I'll they didn't go to the moon. They've never gone to the moon. They had Sputnik that went into space. That was their one technological success. At the same time as they sent a man into space, 40, depending on who you talk to, 40 to 100 million people died, uh, were dying of starvation. They couldn't grow enough food. They weren't innovating. Have you, have you ever seen a Soviet car, an automobile? Have you ever seen one? You know why you haven't seen one? They're very comfortable. <laughs> no, they're not very comfortable. Come on, yeah. give me a break. They are pathetic. They are horrible. As soon as the wall came down, everybody trashed their old East German cars and, and got West German cars. I mean, look, guys. If you can't see the difference, and I'm serious here, if you can't see the difference between East Berlin and West Berlin, then, then get eyes, get glasses, because, because somebody is blinding you. The, the difference is stock. Freedom, freedom is where the action is. Freedom is where the innovation is. Freedom is cool. Lack of freedom is bad. There's no innovation under lack of freedom. The, the little innovation that the Soviets did primarily was stolen from the West. 
They got the nuclear stuff from the West. Even the technology to send man to the to space was stolen from the West. You can't innovate when there's a gun pointing to your head. And that's what lack of freedom is. This young gentleman here is very eager. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm a local secondary school student like in Hong Kong. So I have two questions about uh, this seminar, like, which is related to the problems we are facing in Hong Kong nowadays. Good. So the first thing is that uh, in Hong Kong, so we are definitely a city which, which, have, which has a, a freedom to business, to talk, to publish. But however, so, um, so nowadays for Hong Kong people, so they, they work hard. They work hard for their self interest, like like so as you said. So under your theory, then then that means they should live a happily life, so they can have uh, buying houses, buying cars, like uh, feeding their child, uh, not feeding, like maybe uh, taking care of yeah, their children, taking care of their children. Yeah, but however, like so unfortunately, like they work very hard. But in the research telling that, like for a normal Hong Kong pe Hong Kong person, so they need to work for seventeen. Years without yes without eating any food, buying any clothes to buy a home. Yeah. So do you think this like so they really work hard for their self interest, but it turns out that it doesn't pay. It that yes it doesn't pay. So some of them felt powerless or like helpless. So, so can, I, can I comment on the cost of housing in Hong Kong? <laughs> uh, let me comment. What's that? My mortgages for thirty years. Yeah, I know. Put aside mortgages. It's expensive. Hong Kong is very expensive. For a working person, it's very expensive. Um, uh, I live in California. San Francisco uh, is very expensive. Um, and uh, London, I was recently in London. Everybody's complaining the same thing. People are working hard and they can't afford a home. Tel Aviv, uh, you know, I, I, I'm originally from Israel. Tel Aviv, incredibly expensive. People are right, demonstrating in the street. They can't afford a home. Why? Well, obviously, capitalism has failed, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's dig a little bit. Why is housing expensive in San Francisco? By the way, in Ohio, it's not expensive. Um, why is it expensive in San Francisco, London, Tel Aviv, Hong Kong? Primarily, primarily because government restricts the ability to build. Government restricts building in all those places and thus constrains supply of housing in cities where there's a heavy demand. So people want to live in San Francisco. People want to live in Hong Kong. You want to build more. And yet we are living in an era where governments are restricting the amount of building that is allowed. And this is through zoning and through government control. In free places where you can build freely, where you can match supply and demand, prices of housing shouldn't go up. Generally, housing is what kind of good? Is housing an investment? Anybody think housing is an investment? Now, housing is a consumption good. It's like buying a car. It should be, right? In a normal free market environment, housing you consume, right? You, it depreciates. It should go down in value. It shouldn't go up in value. The only reason it goes up in value is because homeowners like us, like let's say I own a home in my neighborhood, I have a, I have a, a you know, I have a corrupt government who I can influence to limit other people's ability to build houses in the neighborhood so that my house value goes up because I'm restricting the supply of them. And the same thing is happening in Hong Kong. And whether it's because central planners in, in San Francisco, the reason is because uh, they want lots of green spaces. God forbid we should build where there was a tree once. Um, so they restrict it for environmentalist reasons. Other places they restrict it because uh, of cronyism, because existing homeowners uh, don't want them to build because they want their home prices to go up. I don't know what the reason is in Hong Kong, but I do know that there are real restrictions on the ability to build housing in Hong Kong, and that's why home prices are going up. So, so this means that like even Hong Kong people are working very hard, but yep. they cannot still get what they want. Then, then that means that then, then, in the real world, the fear doesn't really establish. No, what it means is in the real world, we should be advocating for eliminating restrictions on building housing so that the housing prices will come back down so we can afford it. In the real world, if we care about prosperity of individuals, if we want individuals to be successful, we should be fighting for more freedom, not less freedom. We should be fighting for less government restrictions, less government regulations, less government controls. That will lower the cost of living, lower the cost of living. Technological innovation lowers costs, doesn't increase costs. 
So if we encourage innovation, if we encourage freedom, the cost of living will go up, standard of living will go up. Uh, sorry, cost of living goes down, standard of living goes up. So maybe some more, like, so actually government have done some policy to restrict the price of the, like, or like the house, house of buildings to go up. But, 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 but what, but what we're in, like, but what in Hong Kong is that those who make the price going up is those investors, like, we buy a house and then we sell it in a higher price. So this is the problem, which, so those so investors sellers, are, sellers don't move prices. Prices are set by the supply and demand. If you restrict supply, prices will artificially go up. This is basic economics 101. And if you want prices to come down, increase supply. And in the case of Hong Kong, just like Tel Aviv and London and everywhere else, the way to change supply is to allow for more freedom in the building of housing. That's the solution. And it, the fact that some people cannot achieve things today is not the fault of markets. It's because markets, the, the rule of supply and demand is metaphysical. You cannot, you cannot violate it. If you violate it, there are always consequences, and we know exactly what the consequences are. Right? You, you, you know, there's, there's rent control now talking in Hong Kong, right? You want to have rent control. Well, there is, there is so much literature on what happens with rent control. This is not a disputed, there's not a single economist in the world. I mean, you probably find one. But there's not a single credible economist in the world who thinks rent control is a good policy. That doesn't stop anybody. Because we want solutions from the government. We want government to tell us how to, be, how to do Because what, what, is, what is at the source of that? Our distrust, deep distrust of markets. Why do we distrust markets? Why do we distrust the law of supply and demand? Because it's motivated by self-interest. And we hate self-interest. We think self-interest leads to bad, bad things. So we'll do anything to restrain the entrepreneurs. We'll do anything to restrain markets. We'll violate the metaphysical laws of supply and demand just so we can feel good about not letting those self-interested entrepreneurs do their own thing. So you want to fight against all this? Fight against the ethic of sacrifice and foreign ethic of self-interest. Okay, we'll go there and then there. I um, have two questions, if I may. The, sure. the first is one that I've struggled with for a long time. Uh, I read objectivist literature like uh, The Virtue of Selfishness or OPA. Everything's great. Boom, boom, boom. Up till I get to the chapter on politics. <laughs> uh, and the, the chapters on politics it tend to be the smallest chapters, quite thin. And the argument for, uh, for limited government seems to come down to the argument of with, without limited government, for example, in a narco-capitalist type of politics – then you're going to have ruling get mobs of gangs and all-out warfare against each other. And I find that a disappointing argument because in all other areas of the literature, they, the arguments are based on principle and not on pragmatism. Or perhaps you could help uh, provide a different argument for me. Okay, so I'm going to try. <laughs> I think the fundamental, the fundamental issue here um, is not – I do think the warring gangs is the outcome. And, and every anarchist example I've ever seen leads to war and gangs. I've never seen that solved existentially. But there's a reason why that happens. So there's a fundamental principle that leads to the war and gangs. And the fundamental principle, I think, and, I, and I'm not going to fully articulate it here, and I'm probably not fully qualified to articulate it here, um, is that objectivism holds the objectivity of values. And therefore that they are, there is an objectively true legal code that is not a question of negotiation and, and figuring out. And while we respect common law, at the end of the day, we believe that, it has, that law should be legislated and it has to be objective. And there's such a thing as a, 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 as a philosophy of law that philosophers have to think about what laws make sense and how you define property rights and that that is that is objective and true and needs to be imposed. And when you have competing legal systems over the same territory, <laughs> if they're on different territories, I'm fine, but over the same territory, there's no objective standard. You lose objectivity. And what happens when you lose an objective standard? What is the only way for us to resolve disputes if we don't have, if we don't accept an objective standard for this? The only way is by use of force, and that's why it deteriorates into gangs. 
So at the end of the day, it's 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 a it's, and I don't want to because a lot of people here this is a internal right, uh, but but that is the source of it. That's one. The second source is force and reason are enemies. By extension, force and markets are enemies. The market is a place in which we engage our reason to solve problems of production. The market depends on the extraction of force in order to, to work. Now what you want to do, or what the narco capitalists want to do, is bring force into the marketplace. Create a marketplace in force, right? Competing armies, competing police forces, competing judiciaries. But markets don't work unless you extract force from them. Now you're internalizing, you're making something that's exogenous, that should be exogenous, endogenous, and it breaks apart. So I'd say those are the two more fundamental principled arguments that lead, ultimately, the clash to gang warfare. Thank you. That's given me something to think about. Okay. Well, my second question, I hope, is simpler. Um, the application of objectivism obviously requires the use of reason and thinking. What would you say to those people who seem to think that they don't have the natural capability to do that? They prefer to emote rather than to think because they find uh, emoting easier or perhaps they feel uh, not comfortable in their own cognitive abilities to be able to think and to, and to rationalise. I'd say they're losing out. Uh, I'd, I'd say that, uh, that they're, they're, they're causing themselves damage. Uh, emotions are great. I love emotions. As you can tell, I'm a pretty passionate guy. Um, emotions are the way we experience life. They're fun. They're, you know, they're important, right? And sometimes they're important in terms of giving us signals that something is wrong when we have negative emotions. But emotions are the way we experience life and really important. But emotions are not tools of cognition. Emotions tell us something about conclusions in the past that we've come to about reality that we're now automatically reflecting back. Everybody is capable of reason at whatever level they are capable of. That's what makes us human. We are, as Aristotle said, the rational animal. Everybody can exercise it at whatever level they can. And whatever, to the extent that they do, they will make their own lives better. And to the extent that they don't, they'll get into trouble. Because emotions, when worshipping, get you into trouble. It really does. Just try it sometime and you'll see I, I can only really think about these things abstractly, so apologies in advance. But it seems that whenever you're making a decision, there are three classes of games. So one in which you do something that's to your advantage, one in which you do something that's not, and one in which you randomize. Um, by definition, also, the first two types of games are just subsets of the other first game. So surely there are... Yeah, at first two subsets of the third? I mean, that was, that was a quick logical transition oh, okay. that I'm missing. I'm missing. Why, why, why are the two just random? Well, no, um, like you can do something. And if you have a, a choice, you can either do something that's to your advantage, yes. do something that's to your detriment, so you yes. have a better choice, or you can randomize between the two. Okay. Okay. So isn't it always to our advantage to do something which is on the outside altruistic? And if that's the case, isn't it also to our advantage, since we wouldn't rationally choose that option, to have somebody make us do that? I, I don't understand I, why it's to your advantage to do something altruistic. That sounds like a contradiction, a logical contradiction. Well, like the prisoner's dilemma for one. Well, but the prisoner's dilemma is a nice uh, is a nice game to play in class, but it doesn't exist in real life, partially because in real life uh, relationships repeat; they're not one-off relationships. And second, you're not you're not in little boxes in real life. You're actually engaged in real life. Prisoner's dilemmas are the kind of things that professors like to teach in class and have no application in real life. Okay, thanks. No application. And, 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 and it, it's sad. It's like when they teach you an economics class of perfect competition. Anybody take an economics class? Study perfect competition? Yep. Take all your notes on that and shred them because it's, <laughs> it's useless knowledge because it's a platonic form. It exists in some world uh, where non-humans live. There's no such thing as perfect competition. Why study something that doesn't exist? What's really interesting in economics is the fact that competition is not perfect. And the fact that we compete with in unequal information, creating different goods that are not perfect substitutes. That's what's interesting. That's what's exciting. That's what economics is about. Perfect competition is lazy economics. Sorry if there are any professors here who teach this, but it is. Uh, and I tell this to economics professors. Uh, they get upset at me. Um, 
a lot, a lot of what you study in the classroom is useless. But in real life, doing something that hurts you is not doing something that helps you. Altruism, by definition, is doing something that hurts you. Well, how can that be an advantage? What's to your advantage is to think. And this is hard. I say to people, being self-interested is hard work. Because it requires you to think long term about what's really good for you. Not what feels good in the moment, but what's really good for you over the long term. That means not just thinking about one prisoner dilemma, which is easy. But thinking about what happens when you have to repeat. What happens when you have relationships over the long term. What happens when you have to engage with multiple people on multiple issues. And figuring out not what will get you instant gratification, but what is good for you. What will make you a better human being? What will make you flourish and happy and successful over the long term? Altruism, by definition, says do what's bad for you in the long term. Sacrifice is bad for you. Here, may I make one quick point? Sure. The philosophy one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, one thing that I think may be part of what's behind this kind of question, it frequently is, especially on, on people who study social theory, social science, uh, there's commonly an equation between altruistic behavior, and especially in social science, and also in biology, interestingly, uh, there's a common equation between altruistic behavior and any behavior that's other-regarding or that helps others. So, for instance, an example of altruistic behavior that social scientists often would use would be uh, rather than spending money on yourself, spending money to buy a gift for your wife. But if you understand the way that, that your own is talking about altruism, that's not what we're talking about. That is, in fact, assuming that one loves one's wife or one's girlfriend, and if you don't, then you have a different problem. But if you actually love your wife or your girlfriend, then giving that person a gift is not a case of altruism. It's selfish. Why? Because you want that person to be happy. And so the social science concept of altruism is a kind of package deal between what, what ethics calls altruism and something else, which actually your own or I would regard it as a as a case of self interest. Yeah. If you define altruism like that, you've removed the scope for altruism. Because if I give all of my money away, I'm still the utility man. I'm still so 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 so, so, so no. Again, rational self interest is not what makes you feel good in the moment. Oh, oh, but it really makes really is good for you. And this is again, I think morality is a science. You have to think about what is the human being, what are the requirements for his survival and his thriving, and act based on those. If you can come up with a way in which you can justify giving all your money away and thrive as a human being, and I could probably come up with some scenario where that's the case, then I'm not against it. Right? So I don't sacrifice my kids. Right? Every parent sacrifices for his children. I don't. Does that mean I let them cry all night? No, of course not. I love my kids. So when I pick them up and calm them, that's not a sacrifice. That's me pursuing a value that's really important to me, my children. When I um, pay for them to go to school, that's not a sacrifice. That's me pursuing the love of somebody that I value immensely. It's a trade. I get from them the love, right? I get their happiness as a, ref as a, as a trade for my money. So you, selfishness doesn't equal lots of money. Money is not the measure of what is self-interested or not. Right? Your well-being is the measure of what is self-interested or not. And what I'm saying is rather than virtue being categorized as what I do for other people, virtue should be categorized as what I do for myself. And then every person's individual responsibility is to figure out what's good for me. And some people, you know, I, I've got a PhD in finance. Theoretically, I could have gone to work, go work in Wall Street and make millions of dollars. I'd rather teach. I'd rather do this right now than have millions of dollars in the bank account. And that's a reality. Right? Money is not the standard. And it, I'd rather do this because I enjoy this. This is fun for me. This is, this is much more valuable than anything money could buy for me. So the measure of self-interest is not monetary. 
the measure of self-interest is your values and your hierarchy of values defined through reason. And if your kids are very high on that hierarchy of values, you're willing to do a lot of things for your kids. I wouldn't consider any of those sacrifices. Now, if you don't love your kids, or if you don't care about your kids, or if your kids are really bad human beings, and yet you lavish them with goodies and money and all kinds of stuff, and you don't get any pleasure out of it, then you're being sacrificial. And people do that. People, people are not automatically self-interested. We're not automatically self-interested. We do stupid things all the time. Stupid things because we don't think about them, which then lead to bad consequences. And if we thought about them, we wouldn't have those bad consequences. And we do things in order to reduce emotional stress. Oh, my, mo my mother's mad uh, bugging me about getting married. Oh, so I'll get married. I don't really want to get married, but I just want to get my mother off my shoulders. That's not in your self-interest. The pain of marrying somebody you, you don't like is going to be much greater than whatever your mother's doing to you. Plus, you can cut off your relationship with your mother. You're not obliged to have your mother nudge you for the rest of your life. You can tell her, stop calling. So the standard is you. The standard is your long-term happiness. I'm not telling you how to exercise that standard other than the certain principles that are universal, like think, right? You have to choose those values. And those values might include money. They might not include money. They certainly will include love. I mean, love, take love. Love which we're taught is selfless. The best love is selfless love, right? I mean, that's, that, that's nuts. Imagine going to your wife-to-be the night before you're getting married and telling her, honey, I'm not doing this. I, I have no self-interest in marrying you. You don't contribute one iota to my life. I'm doing this for purely selfless reasons. She'd slap you. I would go to my wife and say, honey, I'm marrying you because you make me feel great. You reinforce my values. You make my life better. I am doing this for purely selfish reasons because it's better for me to marry you. That's love. That's beautiful. Who has the mic? Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm a year four nursing student at the University of Hong Kong at Mordecai. And uh, one of your major arguments is that force is the enemy of uh, freedom. But I don't think so. I think force is a friend of freedom. Because um, how do you define freedom? Uh, you define and protect freedom by force. As you said, tax is force. It is justified and enforced by taxation law. So law is a kind of force. However, is this kind of force uh, which empower the constitution, which protects our freedom. So this kind of force uh, help us to pursue our own interests, help the minorities to pursue their own interests. So I think force is not um, the enemy of uh, freedom. I didn't hear an argument there, I just heard what you think. Um, so, the only minority I recognize is the individual. Now, I'm okay with force when it's used in protection. So if you're coming at me with a gun, I want the policeman to use force against you to stop you from hurting me. But that's the only kind of force that's legitimate. You using a gun against me restricts my freedom by definition, right? If you come to me with a gun and say, you have to do this and this is, give me your money. We all know that that's restricting of my freedom, right? I can't use my money the way I want to use it. I can't do what I want. I'm doing what you want. So I'm less free. So force is a restriction on freedom unless it's used in self-defense. The only legitimate form of force is, is used in self-defense. And that's what law is. Good law. Good law is law that protects individual rights. What are individual rights? Individual rights are freedom of action, freedoms of action. It's a recognition that you are free to act in your own behalf. Laws protect your ability to act. That's self-defense. That's good. That kind of force, if we want to call it force, I call it self-defense, is the only kind of force that's legit. But to coerce somebody to do something against their will when they're not a threat to anybody else is, is wrong and by definition a restriction on freedom. Freedom by definition is freedom from what? From coercion. That's, that's what the word freedom means. It means acting with no coercion.
When you're free, you're acting with no coercion. You're acting without other people imposing their will on you. That's what freedom linguistically means. That's the concept.